Thank you. At this stage, we can say good evening, and uh, thank you for that wonderful welcome, Gareth. Um, I'm a parent here at the school. I have two children here, Gareth and Ashley. We've been here for about 18 months. And my talk today will be about staying the path. Each journey is unique. And I must say the previous speakers have spoken to my presentation. They've made it a lot easier for me to put a practical application in place of everything that you have mentioned. Do it for yourself. Believe in yourself. Make sure that you stay focused and motivated. So for each of us, the, the definition of the journey to discovery is different because we are so unique. When I was approached to present here, honestly, I didn't know what I was getting, letting myself in for. And I thought about my journey. What had got me here to Leipzig to stand on this stage? Which part of my journey? I've been in the military. I've spent two years in the army nine years in the Air Force, I flew for the International Red Cross in Angola for a year, I was an airline pilot for 24 years, even worked as a financial manager after I got retrenched, and ended up here in Leipzig. And for me, it's, the journey is continuing, but how did I get here? What steps did I take to make sure I had the opportunity to be at Leipzig International School standing on this stage? So I thought... Let me focus maybe on where a lot of you are, the 16, 17, and 18-year-old trying to find your way. Let's start with that part, that part of my journey. Would it be a straight road, as I hoped it would be? Would there be many twists and turns in it? And let me know, I'll tell you right now, in your journeys, there's no such thing as a straight path. If you have that, you're very lucky and unique. We all as we heard from some of our speakers already, have found our way, have found our niche, but it's not through trial and error. And I, I, I heard guys saying, sometimes we'll make mistakes in our decision, but when we are traveling our journey, there's no such thing as a mistake. It's just heading down a different path to somehow get your way back onto the straight path. So I was very fortunate um, to know, similar to God, what I wanted to be at a very young age. I knew I wanted to be a pilot. It was within me. My father was a pilot. My grandfather was a pilot in the Air Force. So that was already within me. But I remember the exact day, the exact moment I wanted to fly a high-speed fighter aircraft and be a fighter pilot. I was a young boy growing up in Johannesburg in a suburb there. It was one of those beautiful summer, summer sunny days in South Africa. It never gets cold there, <laughs> not like Leipzig. So I have to emphasize this. It was a weekend. We had family over, friends. I was playing in the garden. And next mo moment, we heard this huge noise above us. And I looked up at the noise, and the noise was here. And there was something. There was something streaking through the sky ahead of this noise. I was amazed. I was gobsmacked. How can the noise be here and the thing be over there? And I asked my dad what it was, and he told me it was this Mirage 3, South African Air Force fighter jet that could fly faster than the speed of sound. And I was set. My goal was set of what I wanted to be, a fighter pilot. And from then on, my sole focus became becoming a fighter pilot. And I was only eight years old. And I knew. So my journey began. The funny thing about being a youngster, you have this false sense of confidence. Well, well it's not a false sense. It's a false sense in hindsight. It's a good confidence. Otherwise, you wouldn't do anything. So this is where I started my journey. When I, I went to high school, I went to an all-boys high school far away from home, about 1,500 kilometers from home. Back in 1980s, it wasn't that easy to travel between cities. And as I turned 16, I was in my final year at school, I applied to the Air Force. Now, in those days, there was no internet. You had to wait until the advert appeared in a newspaper, okay. in a Sunday paper. You waited for that advert. When the advert arrived, you got the address, you wrote to the Air Force, you said, I'm interested, they sent you the application forms via post, you filled in the application forms, I'll do this. I didn't, we weren't typing in those days. <laughs> we hand wrote the application, sent it back to the Air Force, and then you waited for something called a telegram. It was sort of our internet back in the 80s. Post office in Pretoria would write to the post office near where I lived, it would be printed out on a piece of paper, and some postman would come and hand me a telegram, and he said, right, you've been invited, to a preliminary uh, selection process for the Air Force. So as a 16-year-old, the school organized the transport. We drove for an hour, 
and to a place called East London. We sat in this big building like this with some tables and chairs, wrote an aptitude test, a psychometric test, science test, and a maths test. Super excited, a little bit nervous, thought, great, next year, pilot. Only to be put in a room and told, sorry, you're not good enough. You didn't pass the tests. We don't want you in the Air Force as yet. As you can imagine, as a 16-year-old, maybe you want to go study medicine. This guy mentioned and you get told you can't. It's gut-wrenching. I felt ill. I felt dizzy. I was confused about what had happened. Went back to school, but once again, we learn from these things. We overcome disappointment. We realize there are more opportunities. I had good friends around me who said, take it easy. Our teachers have said, listen, there's no rush. You're still young. But of course, as a 16-year-old, you don't think like that. But at that stage in South Africa, we had to do two years military service. We had conscription. And of course, this became my next goal. I thought, well, if I can go to the Army first, maybe they'll let me into the Air Force later. And I was drafted into the engineers, the engineers' corps back in the South African military. Now, engineering in the military relates to mine warfare. Our main goal was to either lay mines or look for mines and extract them. The second one was demolition. We were tasked to blow up anything that needed to be blown up from a bridge to unused or expired ammunition. We did bridge building. We learned how to build these bridges quickly across rivers. We could build a bridge across this span in a, in a, in a space of like two or three hours so the military could keep moving. We built, we dug trenches, uh, we did water purification. And during this time, I'd reapplied to the Air Force. And two years into my base, two months into my basic training, a message arrived at our regiment, said, right, Feynman, come again for your pilot selection. So I went for my second one, got on a train, back to Pretoria, sat in a similar looking room. Now I was more meticulous. I thought, right, now I must concentrate. Wrote, sat down, focused on the exams, reread them, did all my work, thought, now, now I'm going to be a pilot. Only to be told after that I'd failed again. Now I was getting seriously confused. This is what I wanted to do, and nothing was going right, and I couldn't understand it. Went back to my regiment. Luckily at that time, if anybody here has been in the military, basic training is just survival. All you do is sleep, eat and trust out of trouble. You can't really think about much else, which is one good thing. The second thing was, I had some really good leadership and friends around me. I had a great corporal. I still remember his name. It was just about 40 years ago, Corporal Bailey. And because I was with the engineers, a lot of the people who were doing basic training with me were graduates of engineering. I went from school to the military. A lot of guys studied first, then came and joined the military. So I had these guys, 20, 21, 22, guiding me along the way, explaining there's always my opportunity. Maybe flying isn't there, maybe you should go study. And we, we went through all these scenarios, but because I was so passionate, eventually the leadership here said to me, how, I mean, you want to be a pilot, what can we do for you? And they sent me on officer's course, and a year, year later, I qualified as a second lieutenant in the army, and went up to what we knew in South Africa at the time was the border war region. There was conflict between what was then Southwest Africa and South Africa, who was the protectorate for Southwest Africa. And the Namibian people who were fighting for liberation had set up their bases in Angola and in Zambia, for those of you who may know Africa, uh, Southern Africa, and we were there trying to protect Southwest Africa. So I went up there, I spent nine months up there, and if anybody's ever been involved in war, you never want to be there, you mature and you grow up very quickly when you see some of the sick things that happen during a war. Now, I was, had real big doubts at this stage. I was surrounded by graduates who said, Man, maybe you should go study. I seriously considered dropping, when I finished with the military, to go study computer science, but I went back to South Africa for some r and &R, had a chat to my folks. I'd already applied for the third time. My dad said, look, just try it out. Let's see what happens. So, applied. I was up here in the border region. This is a picture of me at our squadron up in the, the conflict area. And uh, a message came to the squadron, and they flew me back again to Pretoria, same headquarters. But by now, I was much better prepared. I was more mature. I'd seen conflict. I'd been given leadership roles. And I walked into that Air Force selection process, not as stressed, but more confident in who I was. 
because I had two years to grow up and mature. Sure enough, wrote the maths test, wrote the science test, wrote the psychometric, wrote the aptitude, and this time I passed. Now I was relieved. But that's not the end of it. You have to go through a stressful medical if you ever join the military. It puts things on your head, measure your brain waves, check you're not prone to epilepsy. They check your heart, make sure you're not prone to heart attacks. They make you run on machines. They test your blood. They test your eyes. They even put you in these funny machines to test your coordination. But because I was a young 18-year-old male, I was as healthy and as fit as I'd ever been, I sailed through that. Made it to selection board. And of course, the selection board just became my journey. When they asked me why did I want to be a pilot, I told them. I told them what had happened as an eight-year-old. I told him this was my third time. I told him I'd been to the army. I did officer's course. I'd been to the, the conflict zone, all in preparation to become a fighter pilot. And I told him there, I want to fly fast jets. And they said, all right, you've done enough. Come and join us, which I did. Now, there's a big difference between coming a pilot and a fighter pilot in any Air Force. The pilot is just the start of it. You still have to show, once you're in the Air Force, that you have the right... Uh, way of thinking, the right professionalism. You need to be quite a strong individual as well. As you'll notice, most fighter aircraft, I know, I know most of your view on fighter <laughs> training is Top Gun, where they flew a lot of two-seater aircraft there. In my time, we flew single seat. So individually, you had to be very responsible in the cockpit. And all this attitude was very important. So I started my training flying this. I don't know if any of you know it. It's a T6 Harvard. It was actually built as a fighter by the Americans for the Second World War. Uh, if you've watched Pearl Harbor, okay, all these good flying movies that started off, you'll see the old um, Ben Affleck flying this Harvard. Um, from there, I did quite well, and I said, right, we'll send you a preliminary to the fighter line, and we flew these light attack jets. This is actually an Italian-made light fighter jet, and for 18 months, you trained to be a pilot. It was quite successful given my background, received my wings back in 1987 and was actually drafted into the fighter line. We ended up flying, this is a two-seater, if you look below there, right at the top is a single-seater and that was the actual aircraft we used up in the conflict zone. I went back for another three months back in the end of 1989 to be in the conflict zone, but right then the war was slowing down. UN had got involved and peace uh, accords were drawn up and Namibia then gained its own independence late 1989 or 1990. Once I'd done this, I still hadn't flown supersonic. Okay. I was 25, but I kept going, and after three years of flying these, eventually, this was the day I flew my, by myself in what we call a high-speed fighter. This is called a cheetah. I'd flown supersonic, and when you fly for the first time, they throw you in this bath of water, and you sort of achieved. Okay. Flew this for... Uh, six months, then I reached the pinnacle. Okay. I got to what we called number one squadron in our Air Force, flying this Mirage F1AZ, and you'll see I wrote Venom on the side there. That was my call sign. Okay. Again, if you watch Top Gun, that was my call sign. Why? Because I was deadly. Don't get in my way. <laughs> and it was. I was a, I was a, a hard-fighting Air Force jet pilot. I'd worked hard to get there. I was motivated. And I'd reached what I thought was my goal. But remember, we're talking about journey to discovery. Okay. When you get there, there were still many more opportunities for me to experience. Good air-to-air -air refueling. We could refuel in the air. We intercepted. This was just in 1994. President Mandela had just been elected as the, new, as the president of the new democratic South Africa. And Francois Mitterrand came to visit. And we were tasked, because this Mirage F1 is French, we were tasked to intercept him. You can see me there flying on the right. This was our team. And we escorted him all the way from the time he arrived in South African airspace until he landed in Cape Town. So all these little things. I became the display pilot for the squadron. I'd go fly at air shows. And these were all leading me and preparing me for my next step. I have to emphasize, I don't see myself as special having done this. It was just something I wanted to do. There were many of my colleagues who also became fighter pilots, but they had their own unique journey. My journey was unique to me. I needed those two years. I needed those two and a half years to mature, to grow up. If that hadn't happened, I may eventually got into the Air Force, but I would never have flown these fighter jets. Okay. 
So remember, you may want to become a doctor, you may want to go travel, but all of our journeys are different. Do it for yourself. Okay. After that, I mean, with the new government, they needed money to grow the, 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 the country. Military spending went down. I decided to leave the Air Force, flew for the International Red Cross in Angola for a year. I became an airline pilot for 24 years, traveled the world. This is a 747 landing in the old Hong Kong airport, which was fantastic. In that same time, studied a correspondence degree. Now, a lot of pilots make that mistake. You need to keep learning. And I finished that correspondence degree while I was flying the airline, thanks to the graduates I was with, never knowing when I would need it. I've become a specialist in sleep and how to help pilots and cabin crew and maintenance staff sleep and manage their rest better. Um, I, I got more involved in the finance world. And all of these together, all of these together, taking every opportunity, and that's why I want to encourage you when you start your journey, take every opportunity that's given to you. Some opportunities I identified for myself, and I made sure I did them. Other opportunities were handed to me, like becoming a fatigue risk manager. Back in 2004, my boss came and said we needed it for the company. I got involved. Jenny, my wife, was here. We drew up manuals, printed research documents. We got very involved. But we, what everything we did was to the maximum. Because without those opportunities, I would not be standing here at Liz on the stage speaking to you today. Two, two years ago, I didn't even know Leipzig was a country. It was a, it was a city. I didn't know Leipzig existed, let alone the school. All right. So, to finish off, on your journey, you're going to face challenges. You're going to face hurdles. You're going to face obstacles. You're going to feel dejected at times. You're going to feel unmotivated. You'll be confused like I was. But make sure you stay the path. Focus on the end goal. For me, there's no wrong decisions. There's just different paths we're going to take to get back to our original goal. Please do it for yourself. Make sure it's for you. Don't do it for your parents. Don't do it for a family member. Don't do it for your siblings. Don't do it for your partner. Make sure you're doing it for yourself. And having said that, and it's come out in nearly every presentation, you must stay true to yourself. Be who you are. Don't modify yourself to fit in with others. The same way, keep an open mind. And by that I mean, question everything. I can't overemphasize the importance of critical thinking, especially in the social media, fake news environment we're in now. Question everything. That's the way you're going to learn. And remember, your journey will be unique. Stay the path. Thank you.